It's the Real News Network. I'm Sharmini Pires coming to you from Baltimore. President-to-be Trump just announced that his transition team will be headed by his vice president-to-be, Mike Pence. With two climate change deniers at the helm, Trump and Pence, and with them surrounded by more climate skeptics, such as Myra Nibel, who is being floated as a possible head of the EPA, the Environmental Protection Agency. Everyone is now wondering if we will be able to stop the runaway train on climate change. Let's have a look at what Myra Nibel had to say just recently. Science has settled global warming is not a crisis. Carbon dioxide is not a pollutant. We haven't had any temperature increase. I would like to have more funding so that I could uh, combat the uh, nonsense put out by the environmental movement. Well, I hope whoever is elected president in 2017 of whatever party will uh, undo the EPA power plant regs. On to talk about the level of denial and frankly the ignorance on the Trump team is Michael Mann. Michael is the Distinguished Research Professor and Director of the Earth System Science Center at Penn State University. He is the author of the book the Hockey Stick and the Climate Wars. His latest book, co-authored with Tom Tolles, is titled The Madhouse Effect, How Climate Change Denial is Threatening Our Planet, Destroying Our Politics, and Driving Us Crazy. Michael, so good to have you with us. Thanks, it's good to be with you. And I also want to take some time on air just to thank you, Michael, for being so available for the Real News Network. Uh, it's so critical that we cover these issues uh, repeatedly um, to get the message out as far and as broad as we can, particularly at times like this. So thank you. My pleasure. So, Michael, we've made very little progress to curb the rising temperatures and to limit greenhouse gases. Uh, and as a scientist, if Trump governs the way he says he's going to govern, as he did in the campaign, uh, what do you think the effects are going to be? What's in store for us? Yeah, as I've said elsewhere, uh, if we were to follow Trump's stated prescription to back out of uh, the clean power plan, uh, to um, back out of the, the Paris Agreement, uh, where there has been real progress over the last year, uh, in the form of this, uh, this agreement last year in Paris, uh, nearly 200 nations from around the world making commitments to substantially lower carbon emissions. And uh, the U.S. actually led the way um, through a bilateral agreement with China, so representing the two largest emitters on the planet, agreeing to substantial reductions uh, prior to the Paris summit, where nearly 200 nations from around the world were brought on board. So we were headed uh, on to a path, we were on a trajectory to actually acting, to doing something about climate change. But now um, all of those efforts are imperiled by uh, President-elect Trump, who has uh, stated that he doesn't even accept the scientific evidence that climate change is real and will basically try to undo all the progress that we have made here in the United States um, by uh, appointing climate change deniers to the highest uh, governmental positions um, in the administration um, by backing out of uh, basically going back on our commitments to the rest of the world. Um, if we are, you know, if, if we were to pursue Trump's prescription, then it would be, as I've said, game over for the climate. Uh, we don't have any more time to waste um, if we are going to avert dangerous and irreversible changes in climate. And unfortunately, uh, Donald Trump's stated uh, policies and preferences would take us uh, in exactly the opposite direction that we need to be going. Now, uh, Michael, what shocked everybody uh, during the campaigns is that they, the candidates, really didn't talk about the issue of climate change, given the catastrophes we are uh, facing, at least what the scientists are telling us we are going to be inevitably facing. Uh, why do you think uh, that was so? And uh, give us some uh, uh, reason why these issues were left out of the campaign conversations and debates. Yeah, it was, it's very unfortunate. And it wasn't for lack of trying on the part of the, the Democratic candidate, uh, Hillary Clinton, who really did try to insert the issue of climate change into the discussion at every opportunity, 
in the debates. Uh, but unfortunately, the debate moderators uh, essentially uh, ignore the issue. Uh, our corporate media largely ignored the issue. And so when one candidate is trying to make, uh, you know, trying to place an issue like climate change in the center of the campaign discourse and the media refuses to cover it, it's very difficult um, to uh, really uh, get any, any play. For, for that message, for the issue. And uh, that's unfortunately what we saw. I don't think we can neglect the fact that many of the cable news networks that um, uh, hosted the debates and that are relied upon for uh, information, where the public uh, gets their information about the campaign and the issues, um, many of these networks were busy running commercials from ExxonMobil, from the American Petroleum Institute, and you have to wonder if there's a conflict of interest when they're taking millions of dollars from the fossil fuel industry and they basically uh, refuse to talk about uh, an issue like climate change, which of course implicates uh, the burning of fossil fuels and our continued reliance on fossil fuels. You have to wonder if there's a connection. And in that vein, we've just done a uh, film about the Koch brothers and their connection to the climate denial. And of course, now we know that they've uh, uh, contributed like 950 uh, million dollars to various candidates running uh, that ran in the campaign uh, in this recent election. And now we have a sweeping uh, presence of Republicans, both in Senate and the House, and of course in the White House. What will this mean um, in terms of uh, the U.S.'s position on climate change? Yeah, well, the Koch brothers are basically running our government now. Um, uh, Donald Trump, of course, um, is the president-elect, but his vice president, um, Mike Pence, who I suspect will be far more influential in actually um, crafting policy, has a very close personal and financial relationship with the Koch brothers, as do many of the Republicans who are now in power in the Senate, in the House of Representatives. Uh, so the Koch brothers, by basically uh, buying our government through uh, spending tens of millions of dollars um, to influence uh, our elections, have basically achieved what they have been looking for for years, um, complete control of our government. And that does not portend well for um, how we are going to uh, face and deal with issues like climate change, which require good faith engagement across the political spectrum. Well, the Republicans who are now in control of both houses of Congress and the presidency are on record rejecting the science, rejecting the notion that there is even a problem to begin with. And it's very difficult to have a meaningful debate within our politics when one side is firmly committed to rejecting uh, the evidence that there's even a problem. Right. Michael, as we speak um, in Marrakesh at COP22, um, the climate uh, representatives from 195 different countries are present, and they're talking about how to strengthen the Paris Agreement. Um, and they have been fed by some recent uh, scientific studies that say, well, you know, uh, in the current trajectory, we will be facing more like uh, three degrees Celsius in terms of the temperature increase. Um, so what is the trajectory here in terms of the real uh, rise in temperatures that we are de dealing with? Yeah, there, there have been some recent studies that suggest that um, the so-called sensitivity of the climate, how much warming we get for uh, increasing, uh, when we increase the concentrations of these greenhouse gases in the atmosphere through fossil fuel burning and other activities, that the, sensitive, the sensitivity of the climate may be at the upper end of the uncertainty range, which means that it could be even more tough to stabilize warming below dangerous levels, which are typically, um, you know, described as being constituted by two degrees Celsius, three and a half degrees Fahrenheit uh, warming. Um, if we reach that threshold or cross that threshold, that's when we start to see the worst impacts of climate change. And so the latest numbers are sobering. And what they tell us is that um, we do indeed have an uphill challenge if we are to avert dangerous climate change. But there is still time. The numbers don't uh, lie uh, about that either. There is still time to 
lower our carbon emissions, to transition away from fossil fuels in a way where we do keep warming below those dangerous levels. But we don't have any time to waste. Um, and unfortunately, uh, with the election of Donald Trump, uh, we now potentially have a, a government, in the case of the U.S., that is adversarial with respect to the, the rest of the world's governments when it comes to acting on this problem. We have to hold our government accountable um, to uh, making good on our commitments to the rest of the world, uh, to uh, staying uh, in the Paris Accord, um, to uh, continuing to implement the Clean Power Plan, and to allow uh, the renewable energy industry to flourish as it already is. Um, the great growth industry of the 21st century will be clean renewable energy. The rest of the world sees that. China sees that. South America sees that. The rest of the world understands that that's the future of our economy. And so Donald Trump uh, has to ask whether he truly is committed to making this country great, because making this country great means making sure that we're not left behind um, when it comes to the great economic revolution of this century, the move towards fossil fuel free energy. Michael, if you look at the New York Times, uh, you often see uh, photographs of what the conditions out in New Delhi or in terms of uh, uh, rising global temperatures and climate change and the smog and so forth. Or you see masked people in Beijing or something. But rarely do you see the effects of climate change right here in the United States. You hear about one disaster or another disaster or this flood or that flood, but it's really connected to climate change. Why do you think that is? And what would two or three degrees Celsius temperature rise in the United States actually look like? Yeah, well, we don't have to look at the predictions. We don't have to look at the models uh, to answer that question. We just have to look out our windows, because now we are seeing the negative impacts of climate change play out, um, uh, you know, in our, or in our daily lives, on our television screens, in the 24-hour news cycle, whether it's the uh, slew of uh, unprecedented thousand-year flooding events that we've seen around the country over the last year, whether it's the record strongest hurricanes or typhoons we've seen in either hemisphere, um, both of which occurred in the last year, uh, whether it's the unprecedented drought in California, which the scientists who study past patterns of drought tell us is probably the worst drought in at least a millennium and, and maybe even further. So uh, in the wildfires that we've seen break out in the western U.S. Um, because of drier and hotter summers, um, the impacts of climate change are no longer subtle. Um, we are seeing the negative consequences of our profligate burning of fossil fuels play out already. And at this point, it's simply a question of how far down that road are we willing to go? Um, because any, uh, if we do not take the next available exit ramp from the fossil fuel highway, we do commit ourselves to uh, dangerous, irreversible changes in climate. All right, Michael Mann, as always, I thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you. Always a pleasure. And thank you for joining us on The Real News Network.